Let's give God his time. What do you say? Let's pray. Loving Father, I thank you for your many, many blessings. I thank you, Lord, that you are in the business of working through broken vessels like me. And Lord, as we pause to open your word, I just want to thank you that we could be here with the Clinton Lawrence Adventist family. But Lord, they've not come to hear from me. They have come to hear from you. And so, Father, please hide me behind the cross. Let Jesus shine through. Let your word shine through. It's your word that we are told is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. So, Father, use your word today to cut past the garbage of our lives, our stubbornness. Whatever you need to change, Lord, we give you permission. And I want you to start with me, Father. Please, Father, forgive me where I have failed you. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. And I pray, Father, that you would speak through me, that you would anoint my lips, that I might be able to bring meat in due season. But Lord, I also want to pray for my brothers and sisters. Take away their distractions. There might be things weighing upon their hearts this morning. Pray that they would have the courage to set those at the foot of the cross and leave them there. So Lord, help us to focus, to receive a blessing and to be a blessing. For we ask these mercies now in Jesus' name. And God's people said... Amen. Most of us who claim to be Christians know the story of the fall. In fact, we just spent time in Sabbath school reviewing what? The story of the fall. And and the timing couldn't be better as, as the Lord laid this particular message upon my heart. We know some of those elements, especially since we reviewed them in Sabbath school. We know about the garden, yes or no? We know that the garden had everything that they needed. I don't know how it was down here in this particular area when the pandemic hit. I happened to be on a mission trip in Cuba with Quiet Hour Ministries when the pandemic started hitting. And I get a phone call, get notice from my wife, the stores are out of toilet paper. I've yet to figure out how a virus that had nothing to do with gastrointestinal disorders had an impact on paper products for the bathroom. But there's times that we go to the store and we don't find everything we need. Right? Sometimes your favorite product is gone and you have to go to another store or you have to come back, right? But the garden had everything. They they lacked nothing. Can you imagine that, saints? Get your mind around that. They had need of nothing. It was all provided. We know about the beauty. We know that they had a job. I mean, how many of us feel more productive and fulfilled in life when we have something to do? How many folks, when they reach retirement, I I mean, I've had multiple church members tell me this, Pastor, I've retired, and now I feel like nobody needs me. Right? And they, they end up looking for somewhere to volunteer or some job to have so that they can feel needed again. Right? In the beginning, how did God design it? Did they have a purpose? Yeah, they had a purpose. There was a need. There was a reason for their existence. They were there to take care of God's beautiful creation. They were there to look after the animals. And they did it. I love how God designed it. It was supposed to be a partnership. Right? I love how Ellen White describes it, that it wasn't a a bone from the foot that he would trample over her. It wasn't a bone from the head to rule over him. But it was from the side, denoting that close partnership of proximity. And then, of course, sin messed it up. Mercy. The world has often talked about the trouble four-letter words bring, but I'll tell you, it's that three-letter word that messed it up the most. Amen? S-I-N. Well, we also know that as they partook of the fruit, life changed forever. That robe of Christ's righteousness, as we mentioned in Sabbath school, was gone. They found themselves revealed to be naked. That access that they had to the tree of life was now cut off. Why? As we read Genesis 3, right? It talks about lest man reach out his hand, eat from the tree of life, and sin forever. God uses that mechanism. I don't know why he chose to do it this way, but he uses that mechanism of the tree of life to perpetuate immortality, and we get that in the new earth. Don't know about you, but I'm eager to check it out. 
nothing better than some fresh produce. And that's where I'll give some kudos to Michigan. Biggest blueberries I ever saw were in Michigan. I've always loved blueberries, but I didn't know they came bigger than quarters. Dead serious. Some of you, see, you're surprised. You've got to go to Michigan, especially southwest Michigan, and check out the blueberries. In our very first district, we had one of our members, Brother John, never forget. One day he came to me and he said, Pastor, is your car unlocked? I said, it is. Why? He said, don't worry about it, which freaked me out just a little bit. But when I got to my car, he had placed in my car one of these boxes that had four packs of blueberries. And he didn't just go to the farmer's market. This brother, part of his happiness was drawn from going to the bushes and picking them himself. Those blueberries didn't just taste good. They were packed with love. Can you imagine how beautiful God's fruit would been, have been before we messed it up? Before genetic engineering? God had the original organics. What do you say? Ah, oh, but it was all messed up. It was all lost. The ground was cursed. And not only that, death entered the picture. You see, God found them in a state of vulnerability and nakedness. He calls out, Adam and Eve, did you know this? Here's a fun fact to know. Most folks don't know this, but Adam and Eve created the game hide and seek. <laughs> Never thought of that, had you? Is it the truth, yes or no? Were they the first ones to hide? Was God the first one to come seeking? Hide and seek. How well does that work out for a God who knows everything? How well does that work out for a God who sees everybody? Doesn't work. But yet God comes, and not because He's unaware, but He calls out, where are you? Well, we hid ourselves. For what reason? Because we are naked. We're ashamed. Who told you? that you were naked. God knew all these answers, but as pointed out in the Sabbath school lesson, I love that he's asking the questions so that in their own minds they can articulate and think through the results of their actions. As a result of their newfound nakedness, it was God himself who fashioned tunics of skin for them. Now think through the ramifications of that. How did that happen? Did God run over to Walmart? Say, I'll be right back. There was no Walmart, right? There was no need of those things. They were intended to be clothed in a robe of light. Christ's righteousness. Those skins had to be fashioned from animals whose lives were lost in the first sacrifices that were made. Who had to make the first sacrifice? He who created the animals in the first place. So notice the first sacrifice cost God and the grand sacrifice cost God what did it cost you what did it cost me nothing I love that we have that beautiful gift but God gives them these clothings of skin and now we know that they begin to perpetuate their lineage because what was one of the commands that they actually did keep be fruitful and multiply they had that one figured out right and so as we read as they figured that one out along comes a young man named Cain and he has a brother named Abel and we see from the scriptures and if you want to turn in your Bibles with me let's just kind of follow through the story I won't read every verse but you can kind of have it there as a point of references in Genesis Genesis chapter 4 Genesis chapter 4, and when you're there, just give me a little amen. Let me know that you're with me, please. If you need more time, say have mercy. I'll wait on you. I get paid by the month. We got plenty of time. All right, so here we go. You ready? Genesis chapter 4 in verse 2. We see that this time she bore again. It was to his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of what, saints? Sheep, he was a herdsman. But Cain was a what? Tiller of the ground, or we might just use the modern adage of farmer, right? But we could both, we could say that both were farmers. One was a livestock farmer, one was a vegetable or produce farmer, okay? But we have a herdsman and we have a farmer, and these guys are working, they're being faithful. Now, to my brother's point here in Sabbath school, was gardening easier 
are harder after the fall. It was harder. Why? Because the ground shall be cursed for your sake. The saints, I, I know some of you are probably good gardeners. I'm not. I can kill plastic plants. I, I don't know how it happens, but plants, we've managed it. We've got one plant. My wife's telling me to shut up. So I'm gonna... Anyway, it doesn't work well for us. So I do my, I do my gardening at the produce section at Food Line. Okay, that's, it just doesn't work out for me. The curse must have hit really hard on the Bentley line. Okay, so time of trouble, I'm going to need to be hanging out with some folks who knew how to garden. I'll go dig to do what you tell me. It's just not going to work for me. But Cain had it figured out. And I can imagine, even though the ground was cursed, don't you know that his produce probably was pretty good? I mean, you didn't have, like nowadays, in this earth, we have 6,000 years the impact of 6,000 years of sin on our planet. It's a miracle anything still grows. But imagine 6,000 years ago, right after the fall, things weren't at the point of degradation that they are now. You know the produce had to be amazing. And Cain was proud of it. He worked hard. How many of you, it just puts a smile in your heart to be able to have some family or friends over you fix that meal, they sit down, they enjoy that, they kind of lean back and they rub their belly, letting you know that it was all good, right? Does that make you feel good? Yeah, so Cain, in that same type of mindset, wants to bring his produce to God. And notice verse 3, what it says. Follow along with me, please. And I'm sharing today from the New King James Version. It says, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought what? He brought fruit, but what is it? What, 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 in, in what way is it brought? As a what? As an offering of the fruit of the ground, and he brought it to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord did what? Respected or had regard, depending on your translation, Abel in his offering, but he did not respect Cain in his offering. I, I found it interesting I wanted to know about that word respect. I don't know if sometimes you guys look at words in the scripture and you think, oh, what, what, what's it really mean there? Uh, one of the things that I just really appreciate, the pastoral training that they give us in the Adventist church, is we get to study the Greek and Hebrew. Oh, it's just fascinating stuff. And uh, Hebrew was my favorite. Uh, I loved doing the Hebrew. It was, the letters didn't look the same as ours. It was like you were un unlocking some sort of code, like on the back of the cereal box. You know how you used to do the little secret codes? That's kind of what Hebrew felt like to me. And so I looked at this word that's been translated as regard or respect, and it's the Hebrew word sha'ah, S-H-A-A-H, sha'ah. And really what it means, the direct translation of sha'ah, is to look at something intently gazing. Right? Let's go back to that food. Anybody here like pie? Oh, mercy. Anybody like pie? Okay, talk to a brother. If you like some pie, I want to hear from you. Now, I, I, I got to be careful. You know, I can't talk about food too much. I don't want to get us all off track, but I love cherry pie. After cherry pie, my favorite kind of pie is round. Okay? After cherry long as it's round, you say, well, why does it have to be round to be a pie? When's the last time you saw a square pie chart? The moment that it ceases to be round, it becomes a cobbler. Am I right, sis? If it's not round, it's a cobbler. I don't care what you call it. It's not pie. I'll eat your cobbler. But it's not pie. Okay? I can have those likes. I can have those desires. Right? But I've got to like what God wants me to like. And so I can't just make my own choices. Adam and Eve would have given upbringing and training to their children. Do you believe that? How many of you have heard the term living history? I want you to think through. Living history, it almost sounds like it's an oxymoron, right? Oxymoron is where two words go together that don't necessarily seem like they should. One of the examples you often hear is jumbo shrimp. Right, a, a jumbo shrimp. They're two words that don't seem to go to. So living history, well, if it's supposed to be his, living history just means that it's something that's happened and the people who witnessed it are still alive to tell about it. Was the fall living history, yes or no? Do you think the kids, Cain and Abel, 
had heard about what it was like in the garden? Do you think that they ever walked by the gate where the cherub with the flaming sword stood? You ever think they tried to get as close as they could? Anybody ever had the chance to go to, to England, to Buckingham Palace or to Windsor Castle? Those guards, you know what I'm talking about? They got the big curly, the big fluffy you know, head in there, they, and they're not supposed to be messed with. They're not supposed to smile or any of that, right? I've, I had the privilege. I was taking a group of students from Southern. We were going to Botswana to do a mission trip, and we had about nine hours to kill, so we went to Windsor Castle. And one of the students wanted to get close to that guard. And that brother didn't smile, but he looked at him like, I will kill you. He gave him that look, right? That look that said, okay, this is serious. I'm not playing around. I'm going to back off. I can imagine Cain and Abel maybe getting a little too close to the angel sometimes. And Boys, I'm not here as a joke. I'm here as a stark reminder. The point I'm trying to make, saints, is this idea of sin, the fall, what had existed before the fall, what was lost, what was now put at risk, this is something that would have been blatantly clear to them. They would have understood this in a way that you and I can't even imagine. Are, are you following me? Does that make sense? And so they would have had the same upbringing. They would have had the same historical understanding. They would have had the same training. They would have seen the same things. And yet, why is it that two boys with the same upbringing, the same training, the same parents, why would they dare bring something different when it was obvious what God wanted? You think mom and dad kept their first set of clothes that God made? How many times had they seen, well, dad, that's your old tunic. Yeah, that's the one God had to make when I lost my robe of righteousness. That reminder of what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it would have been a stark reminder right in their face all the time. And yet Cain somehow decides, I'm going to bring God some groceries. You know what he did? I'm not trying to make light of the situation. I'm just saying, what did he do? What's the reality of what he did? He comes and makes an offering to God. And God says, I'm not going to gaze at it. Right? Going back to that pie. Sometimes I've intently gazed at some pie. I'm probably still wearing pie from 83 I need to get rid of. Some of you are laughing, but you may too. I don't know. But we intently gaze, right? But God would not intently gaze. He would not focus. He had no regard. I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to acknowledge it. And really, that's what it means when it says he had no respect. It doesn't mean that he didn't love Cain. I mean, who made the seed produce the produce that Cain brought? Ultimately, the produce that Cain brought was God's produce to start with. All Cain did was go through the steps. But God created the produce. He gave the sustenance. He gave the bounty. So it wasn't that he didn't like what was brought. It's just that it wasn't the right thing. And Cain knew it wasn't the right thing. He could not claim ignorance. You ever been pulled over? Don't raise your hands. This is the rhetorical part of the sermon. I don't need to know your criminal history on our first visit. But have you ever been pulled over and the officer comes up and license and registration? Well, what was I doing, officer? And you know what you were doing. You were speeding or acting a fool, whatever you were doing, right? How well does ignorance of the law work out? The very fact that you and I have accepted a driver's license from our respective state means that we make it incumbent upon ourselves to know the laws and regulations governing driving in our particular state. And so you're expected to know it, yes or no? No excuses. And then they will give you that little pink reminder to go study. Well, this might help your ignorance. I've had them. I just make public confession here. I know we're not Catholic, but I'll make my confession. Cain had no excuse, saints. He knew the history. He knew the close proximity of the history of the fall. He could not claim ignorance knowing that God had performed the first sacrifice. 
So let's go back to the scriptures. We're in Genesis 4. Are you still with me? In the verse 5, we read the first part, the part A, but part B says, And Cain, he didn't care that God was upset. See, this brother's looking at me like this. He can't read. See, what I do is I, I have my own version of scriptures. It's called the Bentley Substandard Version. And I'll quote that occasionally to see if you're paying attention. Just to see if you're still awake. You say, well, pastor, nobody ever sleeps in church. Don't you tell me. I, I've seen folk over there look like they're bowing off on something. What was Cain's response when the Lord said, I'm not going to have any regard or intently gaze or have appreciation for your offering? What was Cain's response? He was angry. Now think about it, saints. Are there times when our anger is justified? To kind of point to some recent events. If I walked up and publicly slapped you. Some of you said, oh, what's he talking about? Don't, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Will Smith, Chris Rock. Did, I mean... If I walked up and publicly slapped you, would you have reason to be angry? Yeah. But let's, on the flip side of that coin, I can also see somebody publicly denigrating my wife would give me cause to be angry. Problem is, we've learned in society to take such liberties with other people's well-being that we're supposed to just take it, swallow it, and move on. And we can just make fun of folks and it's okay. That's not God's design. My point is this, not to get into what, you know, who was right, who was wrong. I think they were both wrong, okay, if we're just being honest. But my point is, are there times where anger is justified? Is this an example of justified anger? When Cain's sacrifice was not regarded by God and Cain became angry, was that justifiable anger, yes or no? No, he had no reason to be angry. He had no justification to be angry. Why? He was the one that was wrong. We live in a society nowadays that has multiplied the actions of Cain. If I'm wrong and you call me out on it, I'm the one that's angry. And we use this great cop-out. Oh, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Can I, can I just address that for a second? This is a freebie. This is a freebie. I'm going to address that one. My brother that sang the special music, are you wearing a yellow tie? Donald, is it correct? Mr. Donald. If I look at my brother, Mr. Donald, and I say, Donald is wearing a yellow tie. Is that a judgment or a statement of fact? Now, here's where judgment comes in. I said, Donald, I know you, you knew you were going to be doing special music today and you thought that yellow tie would make you look cool up front. <laughs> now, what did I just do? I went from observing, observing a fact to now I'm trying to make an assumption about the motive behind why he did what he did. Are you with me, saints? To call sin by its right name is not judging. To call sin by its right name is just being honest. The brother's wearing a yellow tie. I don't know why he wore it. I think it looks nice. I don't know why he wore it. Sometimes people come up to me and they say, Pastor, you look nice. Did Ginger pick it out? I love just the assumption that I'm an idiot and can't dress myself. So I've actually come up with a response that I tell people when they ask me if my wife dressed me. I say, listen, I went into the store and they had this dummy wearing the outfit. And I figured if it looked good on that dummy, it might look good on this dummy. Right? They're making a statement of judgment. They're trying to be cute. They're trying. I, I don't get offended. I just like to mess with people. You may have figured that out. But saints, we are not making a statement of judgment against Cain when he knew the right thing to bring and he didn't bring it. He brought the wrong thing. Statement of fact, yes or no? It's a statement of fact. So when he got angry, he had no reason. He was not justified in his anger. 
not only did he get angry. Look at the last part of verse 5 with me, please. But it says his countenance fell. That's a phrase that you and I don't use very much. Well, did you see so-and-so? Their countenance was quite, quite troubled. We just don't talk like that anymore, do we? Countenance, of course, talks about the expression or the manner in which you're expressing your face, right? Now, anybody in here morning people? Where, where's my morning people? You just can't wait to get up the next morning. I, I love you. Listen, listen hear, hear me, hear me on this. Stay with me. Morning people wake up perky. Right, y'all come up out of bed. Yeah, it's another day. Oh, we're so happy. Those of us who are not morning people, we would like to make a request. Please chill out. Please relax just a little bit. We're trying to just get, we're still, we're still trying to convince ourselves that we want to be alive. Those of us that are not morning people, right? But morning people are naturally perky, right? They wake up, their countenance isn't falling. They're, they're excited. It's another day. It's 5 a.m. Listen, I want my clock to only have one five o'clock a day on it, and it's not a.m. I'm, I'm more of an evening guy. Hey, listen, I'll work 12, 14 hours a day right beside you. I just don't want it to start at 4 a.m. I'd rather start at 8 a.m. and work till 9 p.m. or 10 p.m., right? We're just wired differently. My point is, when somebody's perky and upbeat, right, they say, oh, man, they're, they're, they're up, right? They're on that natural high, so to speak. And when somebody is angry or hurt or, or grieving or pouting, are they upbeat and their face is, is raised or are their features fallen? Right? So, oh, man. so you get this picture. Notice the Bible paints a picture. I love the word pictures. And saints, I want to encourage you, read your Bible exploring the word pictures. Take a little time to pause and say, what does that look like? He was angry and his countenance was fallen. He was upset and he was pouting about it. You know, some people, they carry a cloud around them. Can't do anything to make them happy. They're never in a good mood. Something's always wrong. Walk by somebody and say, sure is a beautiful... Anybody ever watch Winnie the Pooh? I know you're ashamed to admit it publicly. I'm not. I used to watch Winnie the Pooh. You remember that character that they had on there, Eeyore? Tigger would come by, right? And he's, he's, he's tigging all over the place and he's bouncing and he comes by Eeyore. Eeyore, how are you? Well, I guess... I'm... It's like somebody needs to get Eeyore on some meds. He's manic depressive. Eeyore was bipolar. I'm convinced of it. He had issues. He was, bless his heart. Lost, always losing his tail. All right, somebody find it in a bush, bring it to him. It was a rough life. Right, but there's some people who choose to be Eeyores. I don't know if that was Cain's natural disposition, but he was walking around in this state of poutiness. And saints, there's, I'm not saying this to diminish anybody's grief when they're going through something troublesome. Please don't take it that way. There's times when we're going through something so heavy that we're not, just, we're not able to muster that face of happiness. I get, I get that. I, that's not what I'm talking about. Are you with me? I'm not trying to diminish that grief or sense of loss. I'm talking about when we're upset about something that is not justified, that we have no reason to be upset about, and we're walking around pouting as if the world has shortchanged us on something. Are you with me? That's what we see happening here with Cain. That's what we see being played out with Cain. He's angry and his countenance is falling. He's pouting. But I love, get this, please hear this. I love that our God loves us enough to call us out when we're acting a fool. I'm glad that my God loves me enough to say, listen, what are you doing? What's going on with you? And so he comes to him. Look, look how it plays out in verse 6. Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. I hope you're still with me. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? The Lord knew why he was acting the way he was acting. Again, it's not to seek information. It's to get him to stop and think about what he's doing. And then I love verse 7. The Lord unlocks the key to happiness. <laughs> The world's searching for the key to happiness. Here it is. 
People tell me the Bible is not relevant. God help us. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And saints, we're not talking about some superficially, societally imposed structure of what's supposed to be right and wrong. Right, because you go over here to one segment of society and they'll tell you this is right. You go to another one, they tell you, tell you this is right. I did not grow up in a set of customs that where you greeted people, they kissed you. Some of you are like, well, I didn't either. Who, who does? Well, first time I went to Cuba, had the privilege to do two mission trips to Cuba. And saints, if you ever get the chance to do a mission trip to Cuba, do it. It is an amazing place. The people are just, that they're so industrious and creative with so little. You know, the average salary in Cuba is $24. A physician, a physician, $65 a month. $65 a month. They work with what they have. They're very industrious. They'll reuse things. They're just so creative. I love going to Cuba. But my first time going to Cuba, I'm there preaching at the Ogin Central Church. It's over in the eastern side of Cuba, not to the far east, but it's in the Eastern Cuban Conference. And as I meet the ladies in the church, they shook my hand, and then they reached up to give me a kiss on the cheek. Freaked me out. I didn't know it was coming. Somebody could have told her, brother, listen, they're going to try to kiss you. It's just a holy, it's that holy kiss. It's that biblical kiss. I didn't know that it was a cultural thing. And then get this. I found out that once they get to know you a little bit better, they'll actually kiss you on both cheeks. So by the end of the week, I was getting double kisses. And it was okay because there was nothing sensual about it. It was nothing perverted about it. It was just saying, hey, I embrace you. I accept you as a brother in Christ. And this is how I'm wishing my blessings to you. Okay? We, we understand. And God says, if you do well, you'll be accepted. You see, in Cuba, it's okay to greet people with that holy kiss. That's what they're used to. How would that work out in Lawrence County? Especially especially semi-post-COVID, <laughs> right? So you see what I'm saying, right? Societies can set up what they say is the right way to do things, but we're not talking about a societal interpretation. We're talking about what God has established. So you and I can choose, and, and if you go to the Philippines, this is not Sabbath dress in the Philippines. They will wear a long sleeve shirt, a linen a very expensive linen cloth shirt that is untucked. It's buttoned at the top. There, there's no tie worn with it. And down the front of it is this, um, what do you call it when you sew designs and stuff? A embroidery. This embroidery that goes down the front of it that's very intricate and beautiful. It's called a barang. That's customary. That's Sabbath dress. So if you want to look like you've really worn your best on Sabbath in the Philippines, it's, it's not this. It's a barang. And then there's people that, you know, I've actually seen, get this, I've seen people who have spent time as missionaries in the Philippines. They have several of those very nice Sabbath dress shirts. They'll come and wear them to church in the U.S. and somebody will call them out for not being dressed appropriately. Why? Because we've imposed what is right here and what's right there. Again, we're not talking about that. God's standard is universal. God's principles don't change. They're timeless. And they don't change just because you like them and you don't like them or you like them and you don't like them. God's principles stay the same. And so when he sets the standard, that's what he's talking about. When you do well, when you do what I've asked you to do as your God, will I not accept you? In fact, catch this. When Cain brought the wrong offering, did God immediately banish him? He didn't get out of here. How disgusting are you? He didn't say that. He just said, listen, I can't accept this to cover your sins. I can't accept this as a thank offering. It's not what I've asked for. 
And the reason I've asked for something very specific is because I have a plan that's eventually going to pay the penalty for sin. And I've got to keep your eyes focused on that plan and not just anything will do to take away sin. So he can't just deviate from his plan because there's only one plan to get rid of sin. If you do well, I can accept it to take the place right now for that sin. But if it's not, I can't. I, w- I wish I could, but I can't. And I'm letting you know I still love you because I'm here talking to you. I'm still asking about you. I'm still inquiring. I haven't turned my back on you. I'm trying to show you the right path. If you do well, will you not be accepted? I love that God doesn't give up on him. He doesn't turn his back on him. But notice the, the flip side of that coin, saints. Now, I know that all of you are astute observers of the church bulletin. And all of you have read today's sermon title, haven't you? Just guess what? If you haven't, that's your encouragement to do that very thing. Pastors spend a lot of time thinking about sermon titles. Who's our bulletin secretary? Okay. And this brother spent some time trying to get a bulletin ready. So let's look at it. What's the title of today's sermon? Two knocks at the door. So we're going to be talking about two knocks at the door or two presences at the door. Let's see where the first one comes in. Here it is. You ready? If you do well, will you not be accepted? Notice the inverse, the flip side of that coin. If you do not do well, who's at the door? Sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. Sin has one desire, and it's all-consuming. It's all-possessing. In fact, when sin takes hold, it takes a miracle of God to get it out of your life. Or otherwise, Adam and Eve could have said, hey, can we just go dip in the Jordan seven times? Or the Tigris or the Tishon, whatever the rivers were before the flood, right? We'd have to go back, I'd have to go back and look at that list. I don't have it in front of me. But it wasn't just a mere perfunctory thing, right? Go perform something. You've done something. You've crossed a line that can't be crossed back over by yourself. When you committed sin, you crossed and created a gulf. You created a chasm that only has one bridge back across, and that's the Lord Jesus. Sin is at the door. Sin is lying there. Oh, come on out. So nice out here. The fruit tastes so good. You'll like it. Look at me. I'm a talking snake. How many times had he heard the story? How many times do you think he saw the tears roll down his mother's face wishing she had not talked to the snake? I know it had to happen. She had to... You see, here's the thing. You and I look back on what was there but we really don't know what it was like. We don't know what we're missing. Eve knew what she was missing. Adam knew what he had lost. We don't. All we can do is hear about it, read about it. And I'm so thankful for the gift of the spirit of prophecy that we get these little pictures of what it looks like in heaven. Man, I want to see that. And I remember after Ellen White's vision of heaven, she said, I come back to this world and it's so gloomy, so dark. Oh, I long to be in a better place. I want to see that better place. How about you? Cain heard these stories. He knew firsthand the danger and the ruin that sin could bring. And yet, what does he do? He's still sulking. He's still pouting. He's still having a pity party. He's still angry at God. He goes out and starts talking to his brother who had done nothing wrong. Bible doesn't say Abel came and said, well, well, God took my sacrifice. Where did that come from? Who was the first kid to say nana, nana, boo, boo? Well, I don't even know what that means. But yet we, we hear kids, kids say it, right? Abel didn't do that. He wasn't acting like a brat. But they go, they're having a discussion. He picks up a rock and he bashes his brother's head in. You see, friends, once sin enters the picture, there's no telling what you and I are capable of. 
And if you don't believe that humanity is capable of great atrocity, do a Google search for the word B-U-C-H-A. That's the city in Ukraine that was most recently identified of men, women, and children being indiscriminately wiped out in the mass murder covered up in mass graves. Happening now! <laughs> Man, I don't know how true any of it is. How, who, how, how true is anything we see on the news? I don't know. But I do know this. Sin brings death. Because I read Romans 3, verse 23, and it told me that the wages of sin, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, I spoke wrongly, says the wages of sin is death. That's what it will bring. And notice, in its early inception, what did sin bring to Abel? Death. I'm thankful that sin's not the only thing knocking at the door. Aren't you? And my wife pointed out to me as we were sitting in Sabbath school, we, were, we always love to just see how churches are designed and how they've been built, how they're maintained. You guys have such a beautiful sanctuary. I love your stained glass. And I'm going to draw your eyes back to the very last stained glass on your right, my left. And it's a picture of of a passage that I would like to take you to now. Will you go with me to Revelation chapter 3? Revelation chapter what? Three. Chapter 3. And I think some of you even know where I'm headed. But before we get to verse 20, let's be reminded that this is a message to a church in a particular city. It was the church of where? Starts with lay and ends in Odyssea. There you go, Laodicea, right? Sometimes we just need a little help. That's all right. So the church in Laodicea, God says, I wish, Jesus says, I wish that you were hot or cold. But because you're neither hot nor cold but lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you, I'm going to spew you, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You sit back and you say that I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, but really you don't realize you're blind, naked, miserable, and poor mercy the cure <laughs> notice the cure to being blind miserable naked and poor jesus says i want you to buy that eye salve verse 18 i want you to buy gold refined in the fire white garments that you may be clothed you see the sin if we embrace sin, it leaves us naked before God because all I have to present if I don't have Christ's robe of righteousness are those filthy rags that Isaiah talks about. All of my righteousnesses, all of your righteousnesses are like what? Filthy rags. And essentially that leaves me naked. That leaves me barren. That leaves me unprotected before a holy God. But he says, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. And I love verse 19. He doesn't say this to put them down. He doesn't say this to just hurt them. He says the same thing here that he essentially said to Cain. I only rebuke you because I love you. <laughs> as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. I'm not giving up on you. Behold. <laughs> Notice, saints, back in Genesis chapter 4, there's something else lying at the door that wants to get your attention, that wants to see you lost. But I love that sin's not the only thing standing at the door. Praise God. My Savior is also standing at the door. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll think about coming in. Oh, no, praise God. I will come in. I'll sup with him. I'll eat with him. I'll dine with him. And get this. This may be something you, maybe you've heard this before. Maybe you haven't. Uh, in Middle Eastern culture, let's say, uh, Roger, you and I worked together for 20 years, but you never invited me to your house. I never invited you to my house. And somebody asked me, say, do you know this brother? Say, I don't know him. Well, you've worked with him for, well, we've never been to each other's homes. We've never gotten personal. We've never allowed it to get closer than just a friendship. I don't, I don't know him. So when Jesus says, I want to come in and I want to eat with you, 
He's essentially saying, I want to come in and be a part of your family. I want to know you on the most intimate level. I want to be where you live, where you sleep. And many times in Middle Eastern culture, where you ate was the same place as where you slept. Where you slept. If I'm going to use English, forgive me. So it was a very intimate space to come in and share a meal with somebody. Even now, when you and I invite someone to our home, we're opening ourselves up a little bit, aren't we? We're saying, come in. See if I live cleanly. <laughs> or see if I live in filth. Whatever, right? We're opening ourselves up. And so Jesus says, I want to come in and I want to get to know you personally. I want to be a part of your family. But saints, notice this. And I'll close with this. The decision to open the door to Jesus has to be established upon a few other decisions. What do I mean by that? Well, let me back up. I would say to you that opening the door, when you hear Jesus knocking, I would say that's the fourth decision. Stick with me. What do I mean? Well, the first decision has to be that I accept the fact that I'm lost. You and I live in a world that doesn't know that it's lost and, and would argue that they are. So I have to accept that I have sinned, that I have fallen short of the glory of God. That's the first decision. Here's the second one. Remember, I told you opening the door is the fourth decision. The first one is accepting I'm a sinner. The second decision is believing that because I'm a sinner, because we're all sinners, Jesus came and died for me. Oh, I love that. You ever read Romans chapter 5, verse 8? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for whom? For me. Don't just, don't just read while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Put your name in there. Because guess who the ungodly are? It's us. So I accept the fact that I'm a sinner, believe that Jesus died for me, and then I would take you to the third decision, which is in 1 John 1.9. If we will confess our sins, he, speaking of Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I don't know about you, friends, but I need that confession. I need that cleansing. And I'm glad. See, here's the thing. If you came to me and confessed, I might be able to hear your confession, but I can't cleanse you. That is a power that is reserved for God alone. That's why we don't go and make a confession to a priest and you certainly don't make your confession to a pastor. Now, if I, if, if I, if I, killed, your neighbor's, if I killed my neighbor's cat, I should confess that I killed the neighbor's cat. But we're not talking about that, right? We're talking about sin. We're talking about the removal of sin. I could confess it to you. Hey, brother, I did this, this, and this, this. I did this, this, and this. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't cleanse me. Only my God can cleanse me. So my first decision was to accept that I'm a what? My second decision was to believe that who died for me while I was still a sinner? Christ Jesus. And I make my confession to whom? To Jesus. And then notice, once I've made those three decisions, now the knocking means something. Without the other three decisions, the knock at the door is another, t is an is another uh, solicitor. The knock at the door is the rainbow vacuum salesman. Knock at the doors of the guy trying to sell new replacement windows for the spring. Right? It's somebody that I don't want anything to do with. But when I've made those first three decisions and I hear the knock at the door, I know it's the knock of the Savior. And today, saints, and sis, I heard you say during Sabbath school that you know, like the old cartoon used to show, show the, the good angel and the bad angel sitting on the shoulder. I'm sitting here. I looked over at Ginger and I said, she's preaching my sermon. Essentially, that's what I'm saying. There's two voices calling out. There's two, 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 two choices I can make. I can either make that choice of sin and choose to be lost, or I can answer the knock of the Savior and I can have eternal life. So my question to you today, saints, is this. Which knock will you answer? Which voice will you heed? We walk around with a long face and, oh, poor me. The world's cheated me. Guess what? The world doesn't know how to treat you, so the world's going to always cheat you. 
The only one that knows how to treat me the way that I deserve is the living God. And if you and I will choose to be partners with the living God, we can get a little closer to knowing how to treat one another with love and with kindness. So today, Jesus is knocking. Are you willing to open the door? Let's pray together. Loving Father, I thank you that even when we mess up, you don't turn your back on us. We see it in Cain's life. It wasn't until he rose up and killed his brother that you had to send him away because of his influence. But even then, you didn't strike him dead. Even then, when he pleaded with you, you put a mark on him that no one would kill him lest Cain be avenged sevenfold. That was mercy. That was grace. And Father, thank you for your mercy and your grace that you extend to us today. Some 6,000 years later, you're still in the grace business. And today, Father, we're saying that we want to make the first decision to accept that we're sinners. We're saying that we want to make the second decision to believe that Jesus died for us. The third decision, Father, I'm asking that in the quietness of this moment, that each person would confess their sins to you. Saints, right now, as our heads are bowed, Cry out to your God in the quietness of your own heart. Ask him to take away your sinfulness, the desire to sin. Ask him to make you born again right now. To give you salvation afresh right now. Father, I want that for myself. Please, Father, forgive me where I have failed you. Lord, you know the areas in which I struggle. You know the areas that trip me up. You know the places where I fall over and over again. Father, please forgive me too. And today, Father, we hear Jesus knocking. That gentle, soft knock that says, I want to come in and be a part of your family. That you might be a part of mine. And so, Father, please help us to have the courage to open the door to Jesus daily. That we would choose him daily. And when that knock of sin comes, when... That sin's lying at the door, biting at our ankles. Lord Jesus, please stamp it out. Kick it off the porch that we might just simply live for you. And Father, I just thank you for hearing our prayers now in Jesus' name. Amen.